Thank you for having us. Welcome Northern Virginia Academy of Ophthalmology. It is our pleasure one year later to give you another risk management course uh, that will qualify you for the risk management discount. I did want to let you know that uh, we are recording just the presentation part, not the Q&A. With that, Dr. Tagani, thank you, Dr. Tagani, for joining me. Uh, he is, uh, as you know, a physician in your area, and he's also the chair of the OMIC Risk Management Committee and a member of the Claims Committee at OMIC. I'm a risk manager at OMIC. We get asked, you know, why do you, how do you pick these topics? Um, it probably won't surprise you that every claim, every lawsuit, that uh, OMIC handles has a documentation issue. Um, and you know, even the Office of the Inspector General has something to say about this. The right care at the right time. At the end of the day, that's what really matters. But you have to remember that it's critical to document that care and reasoning carefully. And I will give a little plug to the risk management hotline I get a lot of calls about documentation. I get calls about documenting the op report. I get calls about amending a record that's incorrect. Um, I get a lot of calls about documentation and I'm happy to help you with any documentation issues that you have. So feel free to call the hotline. The importance of medical records. Many cases are indefensible due to incomplete or inaccurate documentation. Poor documentation makes good care look bad. The old saying, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. And documentation is a reflection of your thought process, rationale, and considerations. Oftentimes, I tell doctors when we discuss documentation is issues, just stick <clears throat> to the facts, right? You don't need the subjective part. Just stick to the facts and make it truthful. The probability of a claim in a 30 year career in practice, three claims, there's 23%. The probability of a claim in any given year is 8%. So I guess what it says is it probably will happen. And diagnostic error is one of the leading issues alleged by plaintiff's patients um, in omic claims. The medical record. So what does it need? It needs to be clear and understandable, accurate, concise, easily accessible. Not easy sometimes in these days of uh, ransomware and EHR issues, uh, legible and has a logical train of thought. Who's gonna see your medical record? Interesting enough, you know, the majority of the people here listed aren't even going to know you um, yet, but they're going to see your medical records. I mean, the patient will know you, but the lawyers aren't going to know you yet. They're just going to see your medical records, the judge, the jury, the witnesses, the public. And medical records can be interpreted in different ways. How will it be interpreted? Is it the young lady turning her head to the right or is it the old woman with her chin down? Elements of medical malpractice. We call it the four Ds. In order for a patient to bring a lawsuit against you, there has to be a duty to treat the patient. There has to be a deviation from the standard of care which will require that the plaintiff attorney hire an expert in your field of medicine. And the standard would be what would a reasonably prudent ophthalmologist do in the same or similar circumstances. There has to be a direct causal relationship between the deviation of the standard of care and the alleged injury damages. And there has to be damages, actual economic and non-economic damages. What to document? The clinical history, the clinical examination, diagnostic testing and the need and interpretation, 
the treatment plan, recommendations, differential diagnoses, side effects, follow-up evaluation, other courses of treatment if the current treatment plan does not work. Sounds good, right? But it's not always easy to do. Via about, I think we have four cases or five cases today. Um, we are going to talk about documentation and where it went wrong in various cases that we have today. Here, now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Tagani to talk about the cases. Hi everybody. So one of the issues that you wanna consider is documentation of your thought process. That way others that review the chart at some point in time will understand what your differential diagnosis was, what your plan of attack was, how you uh, went over things with the informed consent of the patient, the actual operative process, your, your surgical note, <clears throat> the post-operative care rendered in the medical record, and then decision-making if something else comes up, whether it's a pathology uh, result or uh, retina that needs further clarification or treatment. Next slide. The informed consent process, that starts this whole uh, ball of wax. Next slide, please. What is informed consent? It's an oral agreement reached after the surgeon, the surgeon excuse me, advises the patient of the diagnosis and the proposed treatment. We all know we have to talk about risk, benefits, alternatives, and potential complications, and also the consequences of refusing treatment. If it's a lid lesion, it could be cancerous. It could require more extensive reconstruction later. If it's a cataract, you're not going to pass your driving uh, license exam next year. It should always be documented by a note in the medical records and a procedure-specific consent form, which OMIC has at their website for almost everything, and anybody can use them. And the whole process of that informed consent, uh, the whole process is to just make sure that everyone can go back and see what was discussed and how the patient agreed to all of the things that were discussed. Before I go to the next slide, I want to hit on two small but very important factors. Uh, if you're using a premium IOL uh, preoperative informed consent, please, please, please always include somewhere that even though you have a premium IOL, you still may have to wear glasses after surgery. That is a bonus contention with a lot of premium IOL patients. Secondly, if you have a cataract patient that decides they want to change their mind, they need to come back and go through the entire process because we run into trouble if someone changes their mind in the holding area, which I won't allow, I'll cancel the case. Or if they wanna to change to a premium lens, they have to come in and go through all of the process again and sign new documents. Uh, next slide, please. So our first case, it's a lid excision, uh, lid lesion excision, excuse me. Uh, the patient had a lid lesion and the doctor thought it was a minor procedure, so it had nothing in the chart as to why, what it was, the differential diagnosis, why it was done. The procedure went well, but postoperatively, the patient had a very unusual reaction with a lot of scarring and had double vision. Our defense expert said the scarring could not have been anticipated, but the second defense expert criticized the lack of documentation but as to why the surgeon decided to excise it. What was his thought process? What was the differential diagnosis? Did he talk about complications? Um, the case settled because of the lack of documentation for $95,000. That's a lot of money. Next slide. That was a simple case. They will change in complexity. This is a preoperative lack of consent in a cosmetic peel case. Next slide. So a 62-year-old female came to the surgeon and the surgeon did a cosmetic peel. The allegation was that it was a negligent chemical peel and the damages were that she had a facial scar from her cheek to her upper lip secondary to an infection. Next slide. So the issues in this case was a lack of documented informed consent or discussion. Uh, there was no documentation of a patient having a chief complaint of you know, wanting to peel and there was no discussion of a possible infection. So there was no deviation from the standard of care. And so the OMIC reviewer thought this was a defensible case. The case went to trial. Uh, this was an old case. This slide, we thought we were taking this out. At the time, offered, the surgeon offered $9,900 to settle because 
At the time of the case, the National Practitioner Data Bank had a $10,000 um, cutoff. If you paid under $10,000, you didn't have to report to the National Practitioner Data Bank. If it was over, you had to be, report to the National Practitioner Data Bank. This has now changed. There's no threshold. All cases have to be reported. And your, your actual state will have uh, separate and not always Congress rules on what needs to be settled, depending on how the money was paid and who paid it. Anyway, after a two-day trial, well, there was a defense verdict, but the case still cost OMIC and all of us $125,000 to uh, defend. Next case, please. This is a good one. This is preoperative informed consent issue, intraoperative informed uh, documentation, and postoperative documentation. Next slide, please. So the patient is a 48-year-old female who had foggy vision and a sudden decrease in vision in her left eye. She was seen by a general ophthalmologist and referred to a retina specialist. And the retina specialist diagnosed uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy with macular edema left greater than right eye. The patient's past medical history was very important for deep venous thrombosis, hypertension, diabetes, and she was on Coumadin. Over the next couple of years, the retina surgeon was able to treat the patient at various times with panorama photocoagulation, avastin. She had great vision, 20, 30, 20, 40 range for a number of years, and all sudden had, uh, suddenly had decreased vision in the right eye due to a vitreous hemorrhage. So the surgeon planned a vitrectomy with endolaser two weeks after the diagnosis. The surgeon did get retinal, uh, excuse me, uh, preoperative medical clearance and changed the patient from Coumadin into Lovenox. Surgery, uh, surgery planned to do a vitrectomy with endolaser. During the surgery, there was a very difficult to remove plaque adherent to the optic nerve and the macula, and the surgeon experienced a lot of bleeding. So the, the surgeon then decided to change and also do a gas fluid air exchange with SF6. On post-op day number one, the patient with NLP with a 60% bubble, she came to the office on day three with tremendous pain and a pressure of 37. The doctor was not in the office, but the patient said someone there did release some fluid to lower the pressure and give her some pain relief. Unfortunately, her pain continued. She went to the hospital and was admitted where she was not seen by an ophthalmologist for a few days. The doctor finally called her out about two days later from the hospital to his office on Sunday, and her pressure was 62 with a flat chamber. The vitreous tap brought it down to 22. She decided to go elsewhere. That eye remained tricycle. Her good eye then developed a hemorrhage, but after two weeks, it cleared spontaneously. Years later, or sometime later, she did develop a macular hole, had a vitrectomy, and still had functional vision in that eye. So the damages on this first surgeon I was accused of was NLP vision, and the issues here were a very complex patient, very poor documentation. It was unclear who performed that paracentesis in the office. Next slide. So the claim reviewers at OMIC thought this was a very poor outcome, but it was likely uh, a bad documentation made it difficult to defend. Given the patient's medical history and the bleeding and her need to be on the blood thinner, uh, it made it a difficult case. But as Michelle pointed out, bad documentation makes good care indefensible. Other non-surgical options were available but not discussed, and it wasn't uh, documented. Why didn't the doctor sit on the first hemorrhage for a couple of weeks. What else could have been done? There was a questionable care by the providers and the staff, both at the hospital and at the office. And the case settled for $600,000, which sounds like a lot, but the state had no cap on damages, and we were under pressure to settle before it hit uh, policy limits. Next page, next slide. So what are the documentation issues we can learn from this? There was a lack of total documentation on what was done specifically with treatments and drops in the post-operative care. There was a lack of informed consent preoperatively, specifically could the patient sit on the hemorrhage and see if it cleared. There was no documentation of changing the anticoagulants from the cumin into the levinox. Most of the notes, unfortunately, because of carry forward, showed normal on all visits, even in the tysic right eye. The intraocular pressure was not documented routinely, and nothing in the operative note talked about the SF6 gas or the concentration that likely that most likely caused the high postoperative pressure, the pain, and the NLP vision. 
And lastly, it was unclear who performed the paracentesis. It was probably a atomic technician. Next case. As we said, it settled for $600,000. Next slide. So here's a, a slide of postoperative and clinical care in a glaucoma case. Next slide. The patient is a 70-year-old woman who complained of tearing and blurred vision. She had a very dry eye and over the next few years was treated by the MD as well as the OD in the practice with a combination of an alternation of topical tears, cyclosporin, punctal plugs, antibiotic steroids, and intense pulse light therapy. Over that two-year period, she developed cataracts and they thought it was likely secondary to steroids. She had premium intraocular lenses placed and a subsequent piggyback lens in her left eye, which led to some pigment dispersion. She complained constantly of blurry vision, diminished field of vision, depth perception issues, glare, and sensitivity to light. Over the clinical course, she, she developed undiagnosed low tension glaucoma. Uh, unfortunately, pachymetry fields, glaucoma, neuroconsultations were not performed until there was an afferent defect with a cut to disc of 0.9 in the left eye. The other complicating factor in this case was that the practice changed to electronic health records, causing confusion as to what was done on each visit with regard to drops and steroids. Next slide, please. So the outcome was they filed a claim for $750,000. Our defense counsel estimated to be less than that. We settled for 1625. But 60% of that liability was attributed to the practice secondary to the system failures, including lack of supervision by, of the optometrist. And then 40% was to the physician. I think 60% of that went to the entity, if the physician had an entity coverage. Next slide. So what can we learn from this case? Documentation deficiencies here. There was poor documentation of medications used once it was changed to electronic records. There was doc poor documentation of the problem list, especially a steroid response. No one could follow the thought process on the, on the various use and prescription of medications when it was switched from cyclosporin to another or to steroids or antibiotics. And tests were listed in the EHR but could not be found in the records, specifically visual field testing. There were some co-management issues between the optometrist and the MD. There was a lack of communication, lack of oversight by the MD, and obviously a lack of identifying glaucoma in the patient early on. Allegation of failure to diagnose three different times, failure to of the optometry of optic nerves and follow the patient closely, failure to interpret any studies, and failure to conduct the proper test to monitor the patient. Lastly, there was a lack of medication refill protocol. The refills were provided without checking prior notes and Perhaps they checked the prior notes, but there weren't any steroids listed, so the patient was on steroids after having received them from both the MD and the OD. Next slide, please. This is the last case I'll uh, go over. We'll leave some time for question and answer. This is dealing with medical records. It's a PRK case and failure to document disclosure of a medical record. Next slide. So a young 46-year-old female came to the practice and wanted possible refractive surgery. She wants to be free of glasses and contacts. Well, that's a problem as soon as I read that because if you're 46, you're not going to do both. But her preoperative refraction at that day was minus 125 on the right and minus 75 on the left. PRK was recommended because she had a history of myopic LASIK two years prior. Postoperatively, she complained of blurred vision, diminished field of vision, depth perception, and glare. Next slide. Her vision on post-op day one was 2250 on the right and 2150 on the left. Uh, apparently, they just waited on the healing process, but on the 14 days post op visit, the insured checked the laser record and noted a transposition error that she was corrected for a diopter and a quarter of hyperopia instead of myopia. So the next day, the doctor decided to talk to the patient, but there was no documentation of the discussion. The doctor claims he asked the patient to come in and discuss the eyes, but did not disclose the error over the phone. Next case, next slide, excuse me. So the allegation of the plaintiff was failure to disclose an error postoperatively. The medical record never mentioned the error and the patient found out about the error six weeks later from the technician. So besides the allegations of an error, there are punitive damage also because of possible concealment. 
This case was settled mediation for $200,000 because there was an error in the treatment, but just as significant was the alleged concealment. And the physician discussion was never documented. So what's the best thing to do in an allegation, or excuse me, when you have an error? And here, I think it's not just a, an error such as this, but if there's a complication in your cataract surgery, your retina surgery, the best thing to do is to tell the patient about it straight up, first time, first day post-op. Explain what happened. Explain how you're going to do everything you can to make it right. And if it takes someone besides you or someone in your practice to do it, you'll make sure the patient gets the best care. Some people worry about the finances. Well, obviously, you shouldn't be charging anything in a post-operative time. And if the other treatments uh, may need um, financial remuneration, you should offer probably to pay for that as well. Um, always, always discuss this with a, an OMIC uh, advisor if you feel the need. But honesty is still the best policy. And treat people like you don't want to be treated and know about it right away. I'm going to stop rambling and let Michelle take over with the next case. Thank you, Dr. Tagani. Uh, the next case is a, it's actually not a case. It's a call that came um, to the hotline, actually, an ROP case. Parents refuse to return to our facility according to their primary care doctor. And this is documented in the electronic health record. The babies are premature and their ROP risk. Now, ICROP is very specific about screening for ROP and OMIC has some great uh, you know, guidelines, safety net for ROP. Um, in this case, it was a no-show two weeks in a row. And OMIC's highest paid claims are o ROP cases, which makes sense, right? So if you have a baby who is blind for a delay in diagnosis and treatment of ROP, it's going to be a big judgment. So the parent's refusal was well documented and the ROP treatment options were limited in their area. The risk management advice was to call Child Protective Services. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm a little ahead of my slides. The outcome, timely action saves baby's eyes. Time is always of the essence. Certified letter to the patient was recommended, called to CPS, and this will possibly reduce the risk of a claim or a lawsuit. Again, we have resources on the website for the safety net. So let's talk a little bit about this case, the documentation and the documentation. So you document what care is needed. So you need to document at what week the babies are at and what the recommendation is for ICROP. The discussion with the patient, the patient, the parents, obviously, and the parents, the reason for non-compliance. Why are they not bringing the baby in, the babies in? What are the risks? Well, the risks are blindness and the consequences are very severe. So your options are to uh, send a refused care letter certified or have the patient sign a refusal of care consent. In an ROP case, you don't do this. In a 95 year old patient who has a severe cataract and you've been treating him forever and he doesn't wanna undergo surgery, sure, you can have a patient sign a refusal of care consent but not in an ROP case. That will go to CPS uh, immediately. And we do have resources on the website for non-compliance and refusal of care consent form. Let's just talk a little bit about technology since it seems everybody is pretty much switching over now to electronic healthcare records. OMIC has uh, looked at our EHR cases, and what we're finding is it's pretty split 50-50 between a user error and a system error. Um, if you see that you have a great deal of user errors, you might want to designate a, a super user in your practice. Um, and you also want to be careful who you're delegating privileges to. Not everyone should have the same privileges to view and edit the record. Um, and you want to document who has what privileges. System issues reported to the vendor could be a workaround, could be an update in the software that might be happening. 
Um, I think that the feeling I'm getting from offices is they get so busy that they don't have time, you know, to retrain or report to the vendor. But I think it's really important to give them the feedback. Uh, pitfalls, copy and paste, copy forward cloning. What we're seeing in the medical records is that someone's copying and pasting the last visit that has normal findings and it's a visit where there isn't normal findings. Um, so you should have some pretty tight rules around copy paste, copy forward cloning. Um, Dr. Tigani, I don't know uh, if you have any thoughts on that. That seems to be one of the biggest issues is the copy paste, copy forward cloning. Any tips or tricks here? Um, it, it's very tricky because um, I just had a, a difficult case and the patient asked for the records. And as I was printing it out, I realized on, about on 10 different visits, there were at least four times when I have an error. Um, either because I didn't click a button, and so it says that the post-operative eye has a PCI well, and the other eye has a cataract and a PCI well. It's just a, an error, but it makes it look bad. Uh, similarly, um, we have specific ways when we open our chart that when we carry anything forward, only thing, the only thing we're carrying forward are prior diagnoses. No vision, no testing that was done that day. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's almost like a, a list of don't forget that the patient has this other issue going on. We find that helpful when we do it, but uh, sometimes that creates no float and sometimes that can artificially increase what could be the uh, code for that visit. And so mm -hmm. you know what the code should be if it's they're coming in for just a, a sty. So you don't bring it forward on a sty, or if you do, you just change the code to a simple sty and leave it alone. So you have to be careful in doing it that it doesn't cause no bloat, that you don't bring forward an incorrect diagnosis or a measurement that doesn't belong on that day. Thank you for that. Um, do you ever have any wrong choices that you see in the pick list for drop down for medications? Um, oftentimes I check that most importantly because when I see that I also have to then write for the medication. Um, and write a script for it. So uh, the biggest problem we have with this is when the patient then says, I can't afford Prolenza, or I don't want to go to the pharmacy you told me to go to and see you guys want 300 bucks. So mm -hmm. our technicians do a great job of them adding a note and amending, not amending the actual uh, record that day, but of putting a note in the patient couldn't afford it. And we'll ask, they usually will send me a request and say, what do you want to use instead? And so I will then go back and also put a note in saying patient is no longer taking this because of price patient is taking this. It's another, another time consuming step, but at least it keeps the record accurate. So when they come back, and sometimes these 90 year olds don't know what they're taking as far as their medication. So we ask them to bring them with them so we can clarify it. But sometimes the chart has three different things listed and they're not sure what they're taking. So right. if that happens, we just have them call back when they get home and read the bottle to the technician. And then they clarify it with me and we put a record in the uh, a note in the record to make sure that we have the accurate medicine that they're using listed and using them properly. Thank you for that. Um, one word about passwords, just don't share. Um, I think that probably speaks for itself. Uh, if you're letting someone else write your medical record, um, all sorts of things happen. Uh, text messaging and email. Uh, we get a lot of questions about text messaging. Um, CMS does have something to say about it. Uh, they say that it's okay if it's through a secure platform, right? So phone to phone, me to you, not a secure platform. Assure that the text is professionally written and complete. Uh, there's a prohibition on secure text messaging of, patients, of, a, of patient care orders and computerized pro, uh, provider order entry is the method for sub, actually submitting orders. I know that people use text messages to send pictures. Um, you know, you just have to be super careful because, it, because it's just typically not encrypted. Um, HHS for email, okay to email with reasonable safeguards, right? Um, one is to document, you know, the patient's request to communicate via email. 
Uh, typically, they'll send you an email first, and you just want to make sure when they send it to you that your response is, you know, you know, do you consent to communicate via email? And they will say yes, and then you'll have that consent in the medical record. Check email addresses for accuracy, limit the amount of PHI that's disclosed when using unencrypted uh, email, like, you know, any kind of uh, email that, you know, individuals have typically is unencrypted. Although, um, you know, some people do have secure, you know, it, it's better to do it through a portal, honestly, if you can. Don't practice medicine over email, make sure email gets, into the medical record, that's a problem sometimes, right? You need to be sure to scan it and put it in the medical record. Phone records and email are discoverable. Need I say more? Uh, assume someone can read you know, your, your phone, assume someone can read over your shoulder, lock your phone, have the ability to remotely delete PHI if electronic device is lost or stolen. Document your telephone calls. You know, this is a question I get a lot um, about, a, a, I'll just give an example on the hotline. Someone called and said, an attorney requested records for one of my patients. I had um, an outcome that was out, un, you know, it wasn't planned. It was, you know, unfortunate. And I had a lot of phone calls back and forth with the patient and I didn't document the medical record. And now the attorney has requested a copy of the records and I want to go back in and document the file. So uh, I, my recommendation immediately once an attorney has gotten involved is don't. Uh, write, your, write everything down, put it on a piece of paper and it will become attorney client privilege. And you can explain it then in a deposition. That's what most lawyers will tell me. Now, if it's pre-litigation, no attorney has requested the records, and you realize you don't have documentation of some phone calls, and it is for a patient that had an unfortunate outcome, sure, you can document it on the day that you're talking to me and you say you're going to go back in and document. Make sure the date is today. So it doesn't look like you're trying to amend a record because there's metadata, right? There's audit logs and metadata. And what that means is that the back end of a software system, someone can go in and request that and they can see who logged in at what time. So if you're gonna amend the record, just put today's date and then amend the record. And I think you should be okay. Document all calls, uh, calls during office hours with consultants, uh, after hours, uh, from the ER, uh, document everything. Again, the date for your calls, put the date, the time, information given, the assessment recommendations, follow up. And we do have risk management recommendations on this uh, if you'd like to go to our website. We also have resources on the website regarding co managing with optometrists, after hours calls, office telephone screening, no shows, emergency, emergency department calls, transfer of care, and so on. So I encourage you to go to the website. We also have a YouTube channel. Um, it's under the name of OMIC. And we have a great telephone screening uh, video on there and uh, quite a few other recorded talks. Again, I wanna thank Dr. Tagani for joining me. Uh, and I want to thank the Northern Virginia Academy of Ophthalmology 